Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first Heidelberg Joint Astronomical Colloquium of 2022. And um, we're very happy to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Sylvia Tunum of the University of Amsterdam, who is one of the real pushers in this rapidly growing field of interactions and transients of stars uh, associated with stars. And I invite Sylvia's host, Fabian Schneider, to make the formal introduction. Thank you, Richard. So it's a great pleasure today uh, to introduce Sylvia to you. And you will see in a moment, I'm pretty sure, that Sylvia is not only an expert on binary star evolution, as is, is depicted on her first slide, but actually on triple stars and multiple stellar systems that are going to do really funny, interesting things and interact, produce transients. Um, she's going to go into gravitational wave business. So this will be super exciting. I'm looking much forward to it. But let me introduce Sylvia to you a bit. So she obtained her PhD in 2013 from the University in Nijmegen with Reis uh, Nillemans and then moved on to Leiden for a two-year postdoc position. And in 2017, she won the first Veni Fellowship to bring her to Amsterdam. Um, thereafter, in 2019, she went to Birmingham. She was a lecturer over there before she was taking on her new current position in the beginning of last year from 2021 on in Amsterdam as an assistant professor and also, as you can see on, a, uh, on the first slide, as a VD laureate. So we're looking forward to your talk and also to have you maybe next time but also with the Vici grant. <laughs> To you and then you have the complete uh, Dutch uh, <laughs> letter. <laughs> so Sylvia, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. And thank you, Richard. Uh, yeah, thank you for the nice introduction and also for the invitation. I would have loved to have visited in person and I hope that soon it will be able for me uh, to visit you all. But today I am really excited to tell you a bit about the work that we're doing in Amsterdam. And what I'm interested in is simply said, the way that stars live their lives. And in detail, I'm interested in the way that stars interact with other stars and how this every now and then can give rise to these bright transients that we love and observe. Okay, let's try to go to the next slide. Yeah. I, and so stellar evolution is something that astronomy has been investigating for centuries, right? It's one of the pillars of astronomy. And at the moment, we have a pretty decent first order theory of stellar evolution, but many things are still left to be desired. And one of these aspects is how the lives of these stars change if you take into account that they're actually not always single stars, but they're also often found in binaries. So these binaries are really abundant and they can really change the evolution of a star very drastically. They can form stars that cannot be formed in any other way, like helium white dwarfs or blue stragglers or even stripped stars. And these binaries, they matter not only for the stars themselves, but also for their surroundings. So for example, for star formation, the ionizing flux that can come from these stars is very important. And what this plot is showing you really nicely is that the ionizing flux that you expect from single stars is what you see in red. But then there's this huge contribution that comes from binary stars, which is shown in blue and in orange. And in particularly, it shows that the ionizing flux is much larger at late times if you take these binaries into account. And another area in which these binaries matters is if you think about transients. So for example, being in a binary can change the appearance of a transient. So core collapse supernovae, for example. But it can also be the entire reason why we have a transient in the first place. So stellar mergers, for example, or mergers of compact objects that give rise to gravitational waves. And I think it's a really exciting moment to be working in this field because there is really an overwhelming amount of data coming our way. And it sometimes makes me feel a bit like this for those that can still remember the Lion King. Every now and then it reminds me of this. And most of the time it makes me feel like this. So most of the time I feel like a kid in a playground and there's so many more toys coming our way to play with. 
And that huge progress, it's coming from many different areas. So it's coming on the side from stellar populations, from Gaia, PANSTARS, SDSS, from electromagnetic transients, uh, but also from gravitational waves. And to just give you some examples, I mean, it's been just a few years ago that we had the first detection of gravitational waves in 2015. And back in November, the third or fourth, depending on how you want to count it, uh, the um, catalog of gravitational waves was released that had 100 sources already. So just in a few years, we've gone to double digits. And on the side of these supernovae, I think it's also really exciting to give an example because currently with ZDF, we're observing something of the order of three supernovae per night, right? That's, that's a large amount on a yearly basis. But in a few years, when the Vera Rubin Observatory comes online, this is going to go to a thousand supernovae per night, right? So from a three to thousand is two, two and a half orders of magnitude increase. That just you know, blows my mind every time that I think about it. And so this huge progress on the observational effort means that very soon we're going to have stellar populations that will show us a lot more detail about what's going on in these populations. And from the side of a theoretician, this means that my models need to keep up with that. They need to keep up with that increased accuracy that these observations are going to bring us. And it means that for that some of the assumptions that we've been making for decades are not valid anymore going forward. And so today I want to show you two of these assumptions that we often make, or two examples where I think that we need to go to a higher accuracy moving forward. And so the first example has to do with stellar mergers. So stellar mergers are related to a type of transient that we call luminous red novae, sometimes also called intermediate luminosity optical transients, quite a mouthful. And I think one of the most beautiful examples of this uh, transient is V1309 skull. So this was a transient that was observed in 2008. And when Richard Dylanda and his group went back into archival data, they found that in the same location of the sky, there used to be a binary whose orbit was shrinking over time. And so this transient, it's really a smoking gun that a merger can give rise to a transient. Now, at this moment, we have a handful of these, uh, these systems. But again, we expect many more to come when the Vera Rubin Observatory comes online. At the moment, we have rough estimates for the rates of these transients, and it's about one event every 10 years. One event every 10 years is actually quite common. And it means that in our Milky Way, there will be many merger remnants out there. And I think that's very interesting for galactic archaeology. So I'm going to go in more detail about that later on in the talk. My second example, and Fabian already alluded to this, is I'm very excited about pushing the boundaries to go towards triples. And in my mind, this is really a fundamental step forward in our understanding of stellar lives. Right? We used to look at single stars and binaries, but now we're making this transition to triples and quadruples. And the way why, why it's really the reason why it's really a fundamental step forward is when we went from single stars to binaries, what we added to the table is that these stars can interact with each other physically, so mass transfer. But now that we're going from binaries to triples, we're adding something else on top of that, and that is the fact that the orbits can interact with one another. And so making this step to triples can really serve as a stepping stone to then understand the quadruples and the quintuples and anything that comes after. And so in the talk today, I'm going to talk about these stellar mergers, but also about triples. And the last part, I'm going to connect these triples back to the transients that they can give rise to. OK, so I'm going to start with the first part, which is the stellar mergers. I'm going to talk here about stellar mergers in binaries. And so I figured a good way to start this talk is to talk about how common binaries are. So I took a rather old diagram here, but it's still very valid. Later on, I'll show you more up-to-date models. But this shows you from observations what the binary fraction is as a function of spectral type. 
So you see that for solar type stars, the binary fraction is roughly 50%. And as we go to more massive stars, the binary fraction goes up. Might be as high as 70% or it might even be as high as 100%. But the bottom, line, the bottom line here is that binaries increasingly become important as we go to more massive stars. Now, you also see that I drew something else in the diagram as well, or I overplotted uh, white dwarfs here as well. So I also wanted to show what the binary fraction is of white dwarfs. So not only what the binary fraction is of normal stars, but what the binary fraction is at the end of the life of these stars when they become white dwarfs. And I place them here at a spectral type of A and F, not because that's the spectral type of white dwarfs, they can be over a large range, but because that's a spectral type of their progenitors or the most typical progenitors. And so it immediately shows you this huge gap, right? So these stars, they say like an A-type star was born with a binary fraction of 50%, but by the time it becomes a white dwarf, the binary fraction has gone down to 20 to 25%. So what has happened? So this has often been called the missing white dwarf binary problem. And two of the directions that we can look for for an answer is, well, maybe we haven't looked good enough. You know, maybe we just haven't looked for these binaries or we haven't found them yet. Uh, of course, we've looked, uh, or the observers have looked very accurately, but it's difficult to find a white dwarf next to a bright star, right? Like these white dwarfs can easily hide in the glare of a bright star. The other aspect is, well, maybe these binaries have actually merged. Maybe that's why we lost so many of these uh, white dwarf binaries. Now, the thing is that this is something that we can test if we have an accurate enough sample, and we have accurate enough simulations. And that's exactly what I want to show you next. So the accurate sample here is really an incredible sample. It's called the 20 parsec sample, and it consists of all the white dwarfs in the solar neighborhood. Now, you always have to be careful when you say all, right? Never say never, uh, never say all. But in this case, I think we can say almost all. So the completeness level of this sample is 95 to 99%. That is really incredible. So it is very likely that this sample is really complete, that we've had, that we found pretty much all of the white dwarfs here. Now, and when we look at this, uh, this uh, and, and I should say that there's really been a lot of effort of the whole white dwarf community in collecting this sample and measuring their masses and temperatures and other uh, characteristics of these white dwarfs, such as, for example, the binarity. And that's what you see in this pie chart. You see in blue, the dark blue, the fraction of single white dwarfs, and then in colors, you see the fraction of binaries. So the nice thing of this sample is that it's not only giving me single white dwarfs, but also this range of other binaries. And that's what I would like to compare with my theoretical models. That's what we've tried to compare. And really the amazing thing here is that we're comparing not only one population to the theoretical models, but multiple populations in one go, right? So it's not able, I'm not able to tweak one population. We have to fit these multiple populations in one go. Now we've made this, we've made this model of the solar neighborhood taking into account different star formation histories, binary evolution, uh, selection effects of the observations, um, white dwarf cooling, we've taken all of that into account and tried to make a pie chart like the one on the left. And what we find is the following pie chart. So the range in the numbers here comes from the range of models that we've made. And there's two things that I want to point out here. So one is the overall number of sources that we predict to be there in a 20 parsec sample. Um, for the single white dwarfs and also the other types of binaries. And the bottom line is that the synthetic space densities are here are calibrated very well. The overall number of white dwarfs is correct within a factor one and a half. And as Fabian knows, this method, we usually are already happy if we're accurate within a factor three or four. So one and a half here is really good. And it shows that 
if we model another population of binaries where there maybe is a discrepancy between the models and the observations, it tells us directly something about how that binary population was formed. And it's not something to do with the accuracy of the modeling or the accuracy of the method. We can apply this method uh, to study space densities and transient rates, for example. The other thing that I want to point out, that's the one related to mergers. Uh, that's something that you probably noticed when I showed the pie chart from the theoretical side that all of a sudden there's a new color. All of a sudden there's this light blue or turquoise color that you didn't see on the left side. Now that is because theoretically I have two ways of forming a single white dwarf. One way is through single stellar evolution shown in dark blue, but the other way is through mergers of stars. And mergers of main sequence stars, mergers of giants, mergers of white dwarfs, they could all eventually lead to a single white dwarf. And that's this, this second color. And what you see is that that white chart is that that slice of the pie is not small. So it's about 10 to 30% of all the single white dwarfs come from mergers. Right, so that draws me to the conclusion that mergers are really common. And this is further supported by the fact that this issue or this, this large fraction of mergers is drastically reducing these missing white dwarfs, the missing white dwarf binary problem. And it also matches with the rate of the observed transients that are linked to, uh, to mergers. Now, the thing that immediately makes me, well, the thing that I think about immediately afterwards is, well, if there are so many mergers, then where are their merger remnants? They're hiding somewhere in the Milky Way. And how can we find them, right? These are stars that are likely different from normal stars in one characteristic or the other. And so we may find it through astroseismology, right? If there is, for example, an abnormal, uh, a weird ratio of the core to the envelope, for example, or through magnetic fields. Both methods are not that cheap or not so easy to do for a large population. We may find it through rotation, but then Fabian showed us recently that merger, merger remnants may not have such a high rotation. And so I think it is likely to say that, at least for now, many of these merger remnants, we will not be able to identify so easily. And I think that's important in the context of galactic archaeology. So white doors, again, going back to white doors, they are used quite efficiently and quite cheaply to measure ages of stellar population. So if you have a spectrum of a white dwarf and you measure the temperature, you can get a very good idea or a pretty good idea for how long that white dwarf has been cooling in time. How long did it take that white dwarf to reach its current temperature? And if you have the mass of the white dwarf, we can get a pretty good idea for how long it would take a single star to form that white dwarf. And so you pretty easily get an estimate for its age. Now, however, if that white dwarf actually comes from a merger of two stars, your age estimate may be completely off. And just to give you a small example, if you look at a two solar mass star, it takes about one and a half giga years to form a white dwarf. Now, if you take two one solar mass stars that merge at the end of the main sequence, that takes about 12 and a half giga years. So that is already a difference of more than 10 giga years. Right? So, of course, the example that I show here is a bit of an extreme one, but my former student, Karel Tamenk, he looked into this. He did a full population synthesis study and tried to figure out, well, how wrong are we if we assume that all white dwarfs come from single stellar evolution. So your, your error in, uh, in age, that is what he plotted here on the y axis. And then the color is representing how many sources we have at that given age difference. So here on the top, you see systems where a single star forms a white dwarf faster and on the bottom where the binary would form a single white dwarf faster. And you can see that it really extends out until several giga years, but the majority of cases, the age difference is less. On average, we find that mergers take about one and a half to five times longer to form a single white dwarf 
compared to single stellar evolution. Now, in, if you use this method to estimate ages of a stellar population, and you forget about these merger remnants, it would mean that on average, you underestimate the age of the population by about 50 to 500 meta years. And that is interesting because that is already the current accuracy with which we measure wide dwarf ages. So going forward, when these samples become bigger, I think it's time to, um, uh, to take these merger remnants into account. The other aspect is that if you go to more massive white dwarfs, so massive of about 0.9, one or larger than that, then the fraction of mergers goes up. And that's important because these massive, because white dwarfs are used um, to gauge the initial final mass relation. So especially for these intermediate mass stars, uh, if these white dwarfs are actually coming from mergers, again, you, uh, you will have a problem. I also want to end this part on the major remnants with a bit of a positive note. And that's saying that I think the future here is very bright because of the increase in these samples. So I've been talking about this 20 parsec sample, but with Gaia and the follow-up that's needed after Gaia to get the masses and the temperatures of these white dwarfs that's currently undergoing, we'll be able to get a sample of white dwarfs that's accurate or that's complete out until 50 parsec and maybe as far as 100 parsec. So that means that this, this comparison between the models and the observation can be done in a much more accurate way because I'll have 15 times more uh, stars to be working with. Now that is bringing me to the second part of my talk, which is the part on the triples. So the type of triples that I'll be talking about today, they look like this. So we have two stars in an orbit around one another, and then a third star in a much wider orbit going around the center of mass of this inner binary. And so we'll be talking about isolated triples that have this structure of these two orbits, right? So these are hierarchical triples. And you're gonna hear me talk about the inner orbit and the outer orbit, the inner period and the outer period, but then you know what I'm referring to. And these type of systems that have this structure, they can be very stable. So if the outer orbit is sufficiently wide compared to the inner orbit, then these systems can be stable for a Hubble time and therefore survive for, for long times and interact. Now, the last point I want to make here is that these systems are very abundant. And I'll show you that with um, a very similar plot to what I showed before about the binary fractions but then a, a more updated, a newer version of it. So in this newer version, it doesn't only show the fraction of single stars versus anything that's not single, but it actually splits it up in single stars, binaries, triples, quadruples, and this is for young systems. Now, what you see here on the left side, these pluses, those are the observations, mainly based on the, uh, the catalog from Andre Ducovini. And here we have really good measurements that tell us that the binary fraction for solar type stars is roughly 30% and the triple fraction is about 10%. So this is really based on observations. And so it's telling us that for every three binaries, there is one triple. So one in three, right? That's, uh, that's not a very low number. Now, when I go to the right side of the plot, that's where things really start getting interesting because on the right side, by the way, this is a model from, uh, from Max Mo uh, based on a collection of, uh, uh, of population studies. And so what you see here is that in red, the single stars are very rare. And you also see that massive stars are not even, according to this model, not even that often in a binary, but the majority of the time they are in triples and quadruples. So the point that I wanna make here is that for binaries, we saw that they become more important as we go to more massive stars, but for triples, that's definitely the case. So anything that a massive star can do, then triples uh, will be an interesting uh, aspect to look at. Now, triple evolution, as I said before, has been studied only very little on, uh, until recently. 
And so specific cases of triple evolution has been investigated, but an overall picture of triple evolution is missing. Now it's clear that that third star can have a very strong impact on the evolution of the inner binary. But the questions that my group is trying to answer is how does that work? And when does that work? And how often is that third star really important? Now, it turns out that if we want to model the evolution of triple stars accurately, it turns out that we need three ingredients. So the first one is three body dynamics. Right, and this is a field that really made a lot of progress in the last one, two decades, where we have a much better understanding of the peculiar, peculiar <laughs> the strange behavior that triples uh, can undergo. But most of the studies so far, they have assumed that the bodies in the triple are point particles, which makes absolute sense. This is where you start, right? But you can also imagine that at some point that might not be the best assumption anymore if you really wanna know what the evolution of stellar triples is. And so we also have to take into account stellar evolution, stellar interactions, and also dissipation. And most studies, as I said so far, they only looked at the three body dynamics and ignored these other two processes, or they focused on the other two processes and ignored the three body dynamics. And the few projects that looked at the combination of the three, they show that it's a really rich regime that opens up a lot of interesting channels. And so with this in mind, we developed a code to simulate the evolution of triples in a consistent way. Um, and I just want to highlight all of the members of, uh, of the team, because of course, all of the work that I'm showing uh, is, uh, is largely due to, uh, to them. So before I go with showing you some of these results, I have a few more slides uh, to show you a little bit of the background. And I want to show you a little bit about three body dynamics, because I want to give you a bit of an intuitive feeling of what the effect is of this three body dynamics. And the most famous manifestation of three body dynamics, the lowest order manifestation, are called the cosi lead off cycles. Now, what they are uh, is, oh, I should go back. So, what they are is uh, an interaction between the outer and the inner orbit. So, there's a torque between these outer and the inner orbits that leads to cyclic behavior. And the way that we solve that is by solving a set of differential equations. But because I think it's not so insightful to you, I think these equations might not uh, immediately tell you what is going on. I, uh, so in, instead of doing that, I brought a tool. And it's a very highly technologically advanced tool. And it looks like this. So what it is, is imagine that this is your inner binary. And imagine that the blue one is the outer binary, the outer orbit. And this white little thing in the middle, you can see that that's just for me because otherwise I cannot hold it in my hand. Of course, this is completely not to scale, but uh, bear with me. So what is happening because of these Cosalito cycles, there will be differences in the inclination of the inner orbit. It will go up and down and up and down. And at the same time, the eccentricity of the inner orbit will change as well, just from angular momentum conservation. And so we'll go from eccentric to circular, to eccentric, to circular, to eccentric. So this is how the system is undergoing these cycles. Now I'll go back to my presentation. Let's see, we want to share that. So these are the lowest order manifestation of the three body dynamics. If we go to high order terms, we get more extreme behavior, more extreme eccentricities, even flips of the inner orbit that we go from prograde to retrograde. Um, but the thing that is most interesting for me is that these systems will experience a very high eccentricity. And let me show you an example of why I care so much about that. So what you see here is just one example. So in blue, you see here a binary. This is a binary that starts out relatively wide and you see the orbital separation on the y-axis as a function of time. And so as this system starts evolving, pretty much nothing happens to it. 
It just becomes a little bit wider in time as these stars lose a little bit of mass in their stellar nights. Now, if I put a third star around it, I get a very different evolution. So why is this, right? What is going on? If I zoom in into that point where they start diverging, what you see, it is really strong Gauss-Alinov cycles. Now you see this variation in the eccentricity. While in the case, in the blue case, when we just had a binary, the eccentricity was more or less constant. At some point, the stars come so close to each other that they actually physically interact. And in this case, a mass transfer phase starts. For the experts, in this case, it's a common envelope phase. And we expect the orbit to shrink very drastically. Now, the system keeps on evolving further. There's another mass transfer event and eventually even a merger between the two stars. Now, the reason why I think that this system is so interesting is because I took a binary that didn't do really so much, but by just taking into account that it has a third companion, I actually get a merger between two stars. In this case, it's even a merger between two massive carbon oxygen white dwarfs. So you would expect this to give rise to a supernova type or name. So you start with a binary that doesn't do much, and just by taking into account that third object, we get a supernova type or name progenitor. So I think that's a really cool uh, thing that a triple can do. Now, the criticism that I give myself here is that this is just one example, right? And the question is, okay, you can always come up with one nice example that does something interesting. But how often does this really happen in a full population? So to answer that, we did a population synthesis study of triple populations. We took different assumptions for the initial conditions and just asked the questions, okay, what is that typical evolution? So that is what I'm showing here. I'll go through the pie chart slice by slice. But in blue, I want to show you the largest group, the most common group. And that is the group that goes through mass transfer in the inner orbit. So that is very common. About two thirds, three quarters of all the triples go through mass transfer. Now that's nice, but it means more if I tell you how often this happens in a binary population in the same mass range. And in binaries, this only happens in about a third of all the systems. So it means that mass transfer in a triple is about two to three times more common than in binaries. So to put it in perspective, when I first looked at triples, I thought, well, maybe they're not that common. Then we found out that, well, actually, for every three uh, binaries, there is one triple, uh, so three in one. And now I'm telling you that, hey, these triples actually interact three times more often than binaries. So overall, it actually put, it means that triples become, uh, be, yeah, become on even footing with binaries. So if you're interested in anything that uh, binary interactions can do, I think triples would be very interesting for you as well. Now, to go back to this pie chart, there's a couple of more interesting points that I want to mention. Uh, for example, still looking at this mass transfer event, there's other differences with binaries. Well, one is that mass transfer tends to happen much earlier in the evolution of, uh, of the system, which has uh, very strong consequences for the type of mass transfer that you get, if it's stable or not, if it likely leads to a merger or not. And another aspect is that the orbit is very often still significantly eccentric when the mass transfer starts. Well, that may sound like a small detail uh, for many people, but it's actually very interesting because for binaries, we expect the orbit to be completely circularized because of tides at the moment the mass transfer starts. And so in triples, this is not the case anymore because of those Cosalita cycles that pump up the eccentricity. And it really calls for a new framework for modeling mass transfer, because if the orbit is eccentric, you get pulsed mass transfer, where most amount of mass transfer is actually happening at pericenter distance and not at apocenter, right? Well, normally the mass transfer rate we assume is constant over the orbit. And so it really calls for a new framework for modeling stellar evolution.
Now the other pie, the other parts of my pie's chart, I'd love to talk about for an hour as well, but I think Richard is gonna kick me off at that point. So I'll just go through it quite quickly. In orange, we have cases where the first phase of mass transfer is started by the secondary star. So the primary star has already become a white dwarf and now the companion star transferring mass. This is weird for anyone that works with binaries because in binary evolution, we always expect the, if the, if the primary doesn't fill the slope, the secondary likely doesn't do it either. So this is, uh, we recently uh, submitted a paper on this because it might be very important for the formation of cataclysmic variables. So accreting white dwarf systems. Another thing that's very interesting is cases where it's a tertiary star that's donating mass to the inner binary, which may be a way to form twin blue stragglers. And yes, we have observed a twin blue straggler that might be very hard to form in any other way. The purple group is the next one that I would like to mention, which are the systems where the three stars don't interact and they pretty much live their lives as single stars. Um, in this aspect, I want to mention the system that we found in DR2 from Gaia. And this is a resolved triple white dwarf. So three white dwarfs in white orbits. And this system just confirms that indeed it's possible for triples to survive for these long times and to experience all of these wind mass loss phases that stars are going through and still survive in the triple. Now that is bringing me to the last part of my talk, which is where I wanna connect the triples back to the transients. And when I reach this part of my talk, I always feel a little bit like this, like I've been trying to paint this beautiful picture of triple evolution, which is like making a beautiful sandcastle. But the thing I love most after building a sandcastle is destroy it all. So that's what we're gonna do with these triples. We're gonna try and destroy them. And the trick to destroying them is that we're going to make them undergo a change in their dynamics. So we're going to start with these triples that have that hierarchical structure that we saw before. So those two orbits, two Keplerian orbits. And we'll push them to a regime where they evolve on shorter timescales, so more dynamical timescales. And then you start going to a regime where you uh, we go in, you see the movie? Yes, okay, great. Where you start seeing these kind of interactions, right? So these are interactions that were more famous or more familiar with in the context of stellar clusters, right? Where you have a binary and the third star is shot at it and it may interact and it undergoes these beautiful patterns and beautiful behaviors. Oh, there we go. Many interactions. And in most cases, eventually these systems break up in a binary and a single star. Now, the interesting thing here is that we started with the blue star as a single star, but we ended up with the blue star in the binary. And so what it shows you is that you can have exchanges between the star, very close passages and even collisions. Now, this type of behavior is something that secretly you already saw. So this was the red part of my pie chart that I skipped through very uh, earlier. And we recently also submitted a paper on these types of sources. Um, so these triples that become dynamically unstable just because of their own stellar winds, they can be pushed into that regime that is more dynamical or in the dynamical regime. We found that in most cases, indeed we shoot out one of the stars uh, the velocities are up to several tens of kilometers per second. And so one of the things I'm very interested in is if this could play a role for the origin of the runaway stars, for example. Collisions are very common as well. They happen, occur, they happen about one event every 10,000 years, so roughly three orders of magnitude less common than the mergers. And there's also a range of uh, systems that, that undergoes those interactions that you saw in the movies but on very long timescales, right? So we used to think about those interactions as it happening on, um, on short timescale, on a dynamical timescale, on, um, yeah, on a dynamical timescale, 
But these systems, they actually evolve on much longer time scales, sometimes of the order of 10 to the 6 orbital time scales. So they can remain in that phase for a long time. Now, I'm going to make, I want to show you one more example of what these uh, triples can do when they go through this change in, uh, in dynamics. And I'll go to this channel because this is bringing me to massive stars. So let's imagine that I take a triple with three massive stars. These triples are in wide orbit, so they don't interact, no mass transfer, nice and easy. And at some point, they become black holes. And I'm just focusing on those triples that stay, uh, that stay bound uh, due to the supernova kicks, or despite of the supernova kicks. Now, because of the kicks and because of the mass loss, the triple has now gone into that dynamical regime. And where we have stronger dynamics, we have stronger three-body dynamics, we get larger eccentricity variations, shorter gravitational wave in spiral time, and eventually a merger of the two black holes in that inner binary. So this is bringing me to my gravitational waves. The merger rate that we expect from this channel is something of the order of a few events per year per gigaparsec cubed. That's at solar metallicity. And at low metallicity, where the bulk of the gravitational wave sources from LIGO and Virgo is from, that value will go up uh, by a factor of a few, according to Rodriguez and uh, Antonini. And that means that it could be consistent or at least comes close to the lower limit of the LIGO rate. So the point that I want to make here is that this is an interesting channel for many of the LIGO sources. Now, I'll go in the other direction. Now, the question is, of course, this is not the only channel that we have for forming gravitational waves sources in LIGO. The two typical families of channels that people look at, they are these two. So we either look at sources that come from binary evolution or gravitational waves that are formed in stellar clusters or in AG indexed, or in galactic nuclei, so dynamical, dense stellar environments. And my triples, they are a little bit in between. They have some things in common with these stars that interact, and they have some things in common with these dynamics that uh, are occurring in, uh, in, in these dense environments. So the way that I like to look at this is not so much as two separate families, but more as a Venn diagram, where I think very interesting things happen when those two uh, families meet. Now, to make a long story short, we have these other channels. And of course, we would like to know if we see a source from which channel it comes. And so there's a couple of very distinct characteristics that is uh, linked to this triple channel that I just want to quickly show you. Uh, in the plot here, you see the eccentricities that we expect. From, uh, from the triple sources. And now on average, they are a lot more eccentric than the typical sources that you expect from binaries. Um, but unfortunately, an eccentricity of 10 to the minus three cannot be measured by LIGO, right? That's pretty much zero. So there's only a few percent of sources where we expect the eccentricity to be large enough that LIGO could measure it, uh, you know, where it's larger than 0.1. Uh, which is something that they're now trying to build the templates for so that we can actually search for these sources. In the LISA band, it's a different story that more sources will have a larger eccentricity. So LISA can really help to distinguish uh, these channels here. The spins will also be different from this triple channel compared to the other channels. <clears throat> they have um, a chi effective that actually centers the well, peaks between 0 and 0.5, quite consistent with the observations. And also very recently came out that you expect much flatter mass ratio distributions. So this might be a way to explain the high mass ratio systems that are hard to explain with any of the other channels. Now, to finish uh, the talk, I want to make one last point, and that this is just one channel of which in which triples can lead to gravitational wave sources. But there's many, many other channels that we still need to investigate with this future research. And I think the potential for it is really, really great. And it already shows you from one last example that I will give.
And that example is related to the masses of uh, black holes and neutron stars. So here you see by now a famous picture of all of the measured black hole and neutron star masses from electromagnetic measurements as well as gravitational wave measurements. And uh, the gravitational wave measurements are the ones that are connected by lines because this is where we measure a merger. And one thing that became clear from, uh, from this plot is that there is a gap or there might be a gap between the neutron stars and black holes, but there's also a gap on the top, which is called the upper mass gap, which is likely related to uh, a type of supernovae called the parent stability supernovae, where the star explodes and doesn't leave a remnant behind. Now, interestingly enough, of course, you start observing and you find a source in this gap. So the majority of sources are below the gap. We see an edge, but still there is one source that is clearly in that gap. And so the question is, how is this formed? And you know, a very likely solution could be that you can have multiple mergers in a cluster that slowly builds up the mass of the black hole, eventually maybe even leading to an uh, intermediate mass black hole. Now, the interesting thing is this can also happen in a triple. Now that was investigated by several papers that came out in the last say one and a half years and different channels in which these triples and quadruples could give rise to, uh, to multiple mergers, some of them in the mass gap. And for example, if you look on the ones on the left side, then those are the ones occurring in triples. And again, the rates estimates are quite significant here of the order of a few events per year per gigaparsec cubed, where the observations are at 25. Uh, events per year per gigaparsec cube. So definitely, again, an interesting channel coming from triples. So that is bringing me to my summary. I hoped to have uh, given, shown you a little bit at least about my enthusiasm for the future of this field, that there's lots of observations coming that binaries and also triples are interesting in this decade that's coming. They can no longer be ignored. I think we've shown that the models that we have or the methods that we have to model these populations are very accurate. They can, matter, they can measure the space density or predict the space densities uh, very accurately. And they show that mergers are very common and I'm very eager to, uh, to try and find more of those sources. I also talked about triples. I showed that they are very abundant, often more abundant than we usually give them credit for and that they can play a very important role in uh, transients. So stellar collisions, but also very much for gravitational wave sources, in part because massive stars are so often in triples. The last thing I'll say is, I'll just show you that we have a Facebook group for triples, multiples, quadruples, for stars, but also uh, planetary systems, also, um, uh, triples that consist of galaxies, for example, or supermassive black holes. So if you're interested in that, then please join our, uh, our group. And with that, I will uh, give the, the floor back to uh, Richard or Fabian. Thank you so much, Sylvia. That was really astonishing and impressive and didactic and clear. It's so remarkable how this well, I wouldn't say simple physics, but um, uh, not not very complex in its basics is is able to give such far-reaching consequences along the line of, of of deduction as you've so expertly shown us. So I'm sure that there will be lots of questions, and I open the floor. Um, please put your hand up. If you want to ask uh, Sylvia a question, I should also say that we will also be going on further after the formal end of the colloquium if, if we can't fit all questions in. So please go ahead. Um, I think people are still thinking, so let me ask a quick question just to, to kick off. I mean, one of the takeout points was triples are common and they speed up events such as mass transfer and mergers. Yeah. Do yeah. You see, does this affect the type 1a supernova rate in an, that, or in an observable way? That's a good question. So actually we've looked into that as well. So the, the similar channel that I showed for the, the black holes, you can pretty much do that with white dwarfs as well. 
but there we do not find a significant contribution coming from the triple. So the rates that we find are typically a factor 100, a factor 1000 lower than the observed supernova type 1a rate. And so that's the reason why I haven't shown it here. I sometimes add it because I, you know, uh, I like the triples, but I also don't want to say that they're going to solve every problem. All right, good. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, Ralph, please go ahead. So this is really cool. So thanks for this very deductive and, and interesting um, presentation. I, I have a question. So most of the triple calculations you have done is for intermediate mass, mass stars, right? You mentioned the mass range one to seven and a half solar masses. Yeah. And I'm wondering how this result your results depend on the primary mass. In particular, you mentioned in passing winds and mass loss and so on. This becomes more and more pronounced and important as you increase the primary mass. And so I was wondering whether you have already been looking at the dependence on these, in particular in light of the view that most massive stars are in multiple stellar systems like triples, quadruples, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so my PhD student is looking at that and mm -hmm. he actually sent me the first pie chart today. So it's really fresh off the press and mm -hmm. uh, needs to have a lot more checks. But what we see, for example, and what also makes sense is because the stellar winds are more important, you would expect more systems to become dynamically unstable. And that is one of the aspects of the stellar evolution being different. But I think the most important aspect is that as you go to more massive stars, the orbits tend to be more compact when the system is born. And so you start with a very different population of binaries in if you look at high mass stars compared to low mass stars. Um, so that, that also very much changes how often you expect mass transfer in these, uh, in mm -hmm. these massive stars. So for example, how often the third star fills the rush slope to an inner binary will also be more important for the more massive stars for that same reason. So just, no just, a quick, just a quick question for clarification. When you say unstable means it breaks apart because of mass loss, the orbits widen and it can become unbound or... Yeah, so what I mean is from the, from mass loss, the orbit becomes wider. Mm -hmm. Now, the amount of widening is linearly dependent on the, the relative amount of widening depends on the relative amount of mass loss. And so your inner binary is going to widen more than your outer binary because it has three stars. And so that can drive these two orbits closer together, oh, which can make them dynamically unstable. So with dynamical and stable, I mean that we can no longer talk about those two Keplerian orbits, but instead we get that movie. Okay. And Understood. usually indeed, mm -hmm. then one of the stars gets ejected from the system. Thanks. Uh, Rainer has a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for a nice presentation. Just um, in your uh, plots where you show the eccentricity distribution, uh, there was the impression that star clusters give much lower eccentricities. That's according to our simulations, not always true. Yeah, it may, maybe the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, maybe you get the, yes, this one, yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we have actually in star clusters, just merging black holes, 30 plus 60 uh, solar masses, with very high eccentricities. We were actually worried in the last publications that they, they are actually typically higher than uh, LIGO observes. Yeah? So this, it may be the tip of the iceberg, you know, and we don't have a good statistics. It's just a few models, but I think the story for the star clusters is not yet complete, maybe. No, I, sorry, I'll let you finish, but I completely agree. Yeah, so I, I just didn't have more time to go in this, uh, into this plot in more detail. So it's kind of nice that you give me the opportunity to do that. But it's indeed, so these simulations of the clusters, they are uh, based on work from Katie Breivik from 2016. So it's already a couple of years old. And indeed the realization that cluster sources could also be eccentric has come since then. And as far as I understand, they usually find that it's because of two reasons. One is 
you know, these kind of uh, interactions, these three body or four body interactions that lead to uh, eccentric mergers, or also, and I think this is work from, um, um, no, I cannot, uh, Johan Samsing, where you have an encounter. And if there's also some gravitational wave emission that drains some energy and angular momentum during that encounter, you can also can get an eccentric uh, merger. To make a long story short, the cluster sources also have a tail that go to very eccentric uh, sources. So the eccentricity by itself is not enough to, uh, to say that it's a triple or a cluster, but at least we think that they cannot come from binaries. And so I wish at this point that I could say that if it's eccentric, we could say that it's a, it comes from a multiple, but even that is not true because of this channel that you on Samsung. Uh, and so some, some of these were uh, actually yeah. in some transient triples actually, which formed dynamically. And then, then yeah. there was some inner merger, for example, and yeah. second generation merger. So, but uh, we just yeah. didn't start with triples yet, which, which is the next thing uh, which you, you yeah. are also your presentation suggests yeah. uh, strongly just, just to initially start with more triples that uh, probably would give uh, many more interesting objects. Okay, thanks. Um, well, one last question in the main session from Keith Delamont. Yeah, hi, um, so uh, th thanks for a nice talk. Um, I, maybe a bit naive question, um, which may be a bit not entirely directly related to the to this topic. But if you have these mergers of two stars, uh, how much percent of the mass of the two stars if they end up in the main star and how much will be ejected or will it cause another companion that is being newly formed or something like that? How does it work? Yeah, so there are, uh, I, I think probably the best person, the person that most recently did simulations on this is probably Fabian. Mm -hmm. But from the work uh, that was done much more previously, uh, which is, for example, SPH simulations of mergers of main sequence stars, they found that the amount of mass loss was very low. So of the order of 10 to the minus three, and so, you know, in these simulations, we assumed that the mass, well, the merger happened completely conservative. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you have mergers with other types of stars, like a giant with a main sequence star, mm -hmm. which is also a very common type of merger to take place, like a failed common envelope, the question is how much mass does the merger remnant then actually retain? I think that cuts very nicely to the work of like Fritz Röpke's group, where they're trying to study how common envelope evolution works when it is successful, when we, you know, are left with a binary. But I'm also interested in when it's unsuccessful and how much mass then is lost from the system. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, and in the case of, sorry, the case of double white dwarf mergers, that's also been investigated with SVH. And I think they're also very conservative. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, so before we go into the for, uh, informal part, um, I would like to make an announcement. So I'll share the screen to do that. Um, wait a minute. That is uh, next week's colloquium will be by Professor Roger Blanford. And um, he's got a tell us, I think, some fairly fundamental aspects of um, the role of black holes and where the energy feedback energy comes from this process of a black hole feedback. And we look forward to that. So please do join us. That could be quite interesting as well. So now I'd like to finish by asking everybody to open up their microphones and their screens to give uh, Sylvia a very great thank you for this really fascinating colloquium. Thank you very much.